morning. The reading this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 52, from verse 13 to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12. And this can be found on page 613 in your pew Bibles. <clears throat> Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was his will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted for righteousness, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Lon, for reading the word of God for us. A very good morning to all of you, dear friends. <clears throat> it is wonderful to be together around the word of the Lord. And Stuart, he's still really young and a bit naive. <laughs> Thank you, brother, for finishing for the good cause. I can see that is in the family. Your little daughter, she does, she does the running around a lot. <laughs> That's great. <clears throat> Let's bow our head in prayer. 
Father God, we thank you for your word, and we do pray that as we tend to it now, you will be gracious to refresh our mind and heart anew about the cross of Christ and the necessity for it, Lord. I do pray that you will help us to see what Christ went through to brought us back from our sin to God. May you be honored and be glorified as we behold you, Lord Jesus, through this passage as the great King that you are. And help us, Lord, to worship you as we ought. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in focusing our minds to the coming Easter weekend, I couldn't think of a better suited passage than Isaiah 52, verse 13 to 53, verse 12, under the title, Jesus Crucified, God's Plan for Salvation. It looks like a foolish plan, and no wonder the Apostle Paul emphasize the point that the message of the cross is foolish to the world. It, it really does look like a foolish plan. It, it really doesn't look like it's going to succeed. It doesn't look like this is the king that would rescue us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. For the Jews, it doesn't look like Jesus was the king that could rescue them from the oppression of the Roman Empire. And this passage is part of the four seventh songs of Isaiah, which start from Isaiah 42 and 49 and 50, then 52 and 53, which is our passage today. And this passage arguably is the greatest chapter in the Bible. Charles, Charles Spurgeon called this passage the Bible in miniature, the gospel at its essence. It is the leading messianic text of the Old Testament and is referred to in the writing of the apostle more than any other passages in the Old Testament. It points to the person and mission of Jesus, his life, death, burial, resurrection, exaltation, as well as his intercession. And it does that more than any other passage in the Old Testament. It also lays the theological foundation of the gospel like no other. It points both to the crucifixion and the atoning work of Christ in a manner that sounds like Isaiah was there and it, it was written not as a prophecy but as history or not as, a, yeah, not as a prophecy but as history the way he writes it. He writes it like he was an eyewitness who was there witnessing what went between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Even the way he talks about his intercession. And he focuses us on the cross. And Christianity is all about the cross. And by the cross, I mean the wooden post where Jesus was crucified. And this was the standard means of execution in Romans' time. The wrists and ankles of the, of the victim were nailed on the wood 
which then was slaughtered on the ground into the ground, and there the man hung till he died. And yet the cross has always been the central symbol of Christianity since the beginning. Christians have identified themselves with the cross on which Jesus died. But unfortunately, in our days, it's no longer important the way it was. At least that's what the so-called leading thinkers of, of, of our days say. In one of the biggest annual theological conferences, in Yale University in New York in the early 90s, one speaker objected to Christianity's obsession with the cross. I don't think we need folks hanging on crosses and blood dripping and weird stuff, the speaker said, talking about the cross of Christ. In other words, who need it? Who need the cross? Even in our churches today, you preach the cross through and through. It's not going to be longer before someone says to you, is there nothing else that you can preach on than the cross? It is true, dear friend, there is something unpleasant to look at about crucifixion, and the Bible does not overlook that, as you see from our text this morning. The cross is unpleasant as well as it is unpopular, but it is still necessary. For there is no Christianity without the cross, no forgiveness of sin without the cross, no justification before God without the cross. It is still necessary. Let me draw to your attention briefly two main points from our passage that was read by Lorna early this late just now this morning. The first main point I want us to look at is Jesus, the crucified servant of the Lord. He is called here the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want us to notice two things in chapter 52, verse 13 to 53, verse 9. The first thing that we see is Jesus, the, exalt, the exalted servant of the Lord. It is, it is interesting the way Isaiah writes here first present, at least in our passage, the exaltation of Jesus Christ so that when you see his humiliation, you know that the one that has been humiliated to the bottom is the one that is going to be exalted by God. Listen to what verse 13 says of chapter 50, 52. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. So verse 13 emphasizes the exaltation of, of the servant of the Lord. He is to rise, lifted up, elevated to a very high position following his crucifixion. First, he has to be crucified. The way to kinship, the way to the throne, the way to the exaltation, to the highest level, is the way of the cross, which is the lowest humiliation. In verse 14 to 15, the servant, the servant's humiliation is now set forth as we're going to explore it right through the end of chapter 53. 
His appearance disfigured beyond of any man and his form beyond human likeness. And that's what caused him to be rejected. The suggestion that the Savior, the Messiah to the Jew, he has to suffer the way the Lord Jesus Christ suffered, it was appalling to them. The two were not compatible. He was disfigured and marred to such an extent that he hardly seemed human. I don't think when we even watch the movies about his crucifixion or thinking and imagining through the pages of the Bible do we have the slightest idea what he went through. And Isaiah here is describing it for us in a vivid form. He was disfigured and marred to such an extent that he hardly seemed human. It is in that condition that Isaiah continues to say something that is completely unbelievable. He said, but the result of his crucifixion, Jesus sprinkled many nations a reference to the sprinkling of his blood upon those who will believe for the cleansing of their sin. He does that to his lowest point, human, humanly speaking. So number two, we see the rejected and humiliated servant of the Lord. Now move to 53 verse 1 to 3. Isaiah said, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It's quite a strange question because it is a question that implies the answer. After describing the way Jesus was disfigured. No one's going to believe that that's the Savior, that's the Messiah. At least the Jew, they're not going to believe that. They're not going to want to hear it unless God reveals it. It has to take the grace of God for you and I to believe that Jesus is the Savior. It had to take the grace of God and the work of his spirit to reveal even to the Jewish believers that indeed Jesus was the Messiah. He is the Messiah of the world, not just of the Jews. And the Spirit of God does that work as we expand the, the Bible Sunday in, Sunday out, as I'm doing this morning. He is at work even in our midst here. He is at work even those who are online to reveal his glorious messianic through this passage. But of course, our mind suppresses the truth that is in our heart. We are wired by God in such a way that we will know when he speaks to us. We will understand when he speaks to us, but the reasoning of our polluted mind by sin suppresses the truth. He continued, for he grew, verse 2, up before him like a young plant and like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form of majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. He was not an impressive guy to look at. 
Even before he went to the cross, he was just an ordinary human being. And people did not think that he's the guy to follow. So this figure that merges from these seven songs does not look and sound like a deliverer who will free the Jewish people from Roman oppression, as I said earlier. This Messiah of Isaiah seems more of a victim than a conqueror. And the cross made that worse because the cross was, after all, a symbol of rejection and curse. At least that what Deuteronomy 21 verse 23 and Galatians 3 verse 13 says about the cross. Curse is the one that is hanging on the tree. Not that he did not look impressive before he went to the cross, but the cross made it even worse. As far as humans were concerned, around that time, he was accursed. And he was, not for his sin, for your sin and my sin. He was a curse. He died the death of curse in your place and in my place because that's what we deserve. That's what you deserve and that's what I deserve. Because he died that death, he was despised and rejected. And the question then is appropriate. Who can believe that? Who in his right mind will listen to that and analyze that and believe that? That's the question that Isaiah is asking here as he opens 53. And he gave that's the answer in the question. God has to reveal it. He has to reveal it. I normally said when you listen to the gospel preach, listen prayerfully because this is the only way out of hell. This is the only way out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It's hang on the message of the cross. And John 1 verse 11 rightly says, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. And number three, we see the atoning work of the servant in verse four to six. Verse four to six forms the very centerpiece of the song. They also speak most clearly of the atoning work of the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of us sinners. Here and perhaps nowhere else in the Old Testament, as nowhere else in the Old Testament, Calvary is clearly disclosed. The pain and rejection experienced by Jesus are not his, for his own sin, but are for our sin. The rejection he suffers are our rejection by God. And the whole cause of suffering lies in the idea of substitution and satisfaction in that he took, just listen to the way Isaiah puts this, he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. 
we all lack like lost sheep. We all lack like sheep, sorry, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own ways, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. If you remember when Jesus was on the cross crying, my Lord, my Lord, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because at that moment, our iniquities was laid upon Jesus as he was paying the price for it. And Isaiah helps us to understand what he went through for us. So the notion of substitution here is that one person takes the place of another in order to bear pain and so to save the other from the pain. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He is taking our place completely. He, he, is, he is counted as the one who has offended God, who has sinned. And he takes upon himself our iniquities. And he pays the price for our sin. So verse 4, so, that, so rather the statement that he was stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted in verse 4 leads into the idea of satisfaction. God did it. In fact, Isaiah, it says it pleased God to do that. It satisfied God, God's justice to do that to Jesus. It leads into the idea of satisfaction, for it raises the question why the servant should be punished. With the answer to that, as God was pleased, is that sin, that is not Jesus' sin, our sin, you and I, cannot and will not go unpunished, dear friends. God's justice demands that sin meet its deserved penalty either in us going to hell or in a substitute. So it's either you embrace that Christ died on your place and ask God to forgive you your sin on the basis of the death of Jesus in your place, or you will surely pay for your sin eternally in hell. And the gospel, dear friend, is that such a substitute is provided for you and I in Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what the gospel is. That's what the good news is. Someone has to die because the wages of sin is death. It's either you're going to pay for your sin or Christ paid for your sin and he paid it all and all to him we owe. Or you will pay for yourself. I've told this story before. One of the ministers in one of the big church in London, in London, he was he was he was doing pastoral visit, and he was visiting the old members of the church, and he will go with the holy communion element 
to 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 participate with them because they were no longer able to come to church. So he felt moved by God to ask the question to one this dear old lady, do you know why we're having Holy Communion? He said, yes, because I've been paying tithes to the church since I was young. And I've been a faithful member of the church. Surely you should bring me Holy Communion. And so this brother said, no, we're having Holy Communion because Jesus paid for your sin on the cross. And the lady said, no way, no one will pay for my sin. And the brother packed the element. He didn't save the Holy Communion because she didn't have a clue of why they were doing that. For I hope you do have a clue every Sunday, most of the Sunday at the end of the month, when we have our Holy Communion, you understand why we're doing that. Because if you don't, in no position of participating, you got no business whatsoever. It's got nothing to do with you and what you do. It's got everything to do with Jesus and what he did for you. And if you don't embrace that, you should not touch it. Because if you do, you do touch it, you eat in judgment to yourself. That's what the Bible says. Number four, we see Jesus the silent suffering servant of the Lord. Verse 79, <clears throat> listen to what verse 7 says. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that, bef that, that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Verse 7 to 9 tells us, tells of the servant suffering, his trial, death, and burial. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. So the mention of the burial, I don't know if you notice here in Isaiah, as Lorna was reading, the mention of the burial toward the end in a rich man's tomb in verse 9 is what happened in Matthew 27. If you remember the story of Jesus, Joseph of, of Arimathea, a rich man, gave his tomb to Jesus. He was laid on that tomb, and Isaiah talks about it here. And that drives the Bible critics crazy. They don't believe that. They think that it can't be genuine. It's too accurate. But that's the Bible. Despite the violence of his trial, death, oppression, affliction, and slaughtering, it is his silence, dear friend, that magnifies the atoning work of Christ. I grew up as a shepherd. I did not go to school. And so I know more about animals than I know about what you learn from school. And I've slaughtered goats. And I think it was a revenge because goats, they just trouble some animals. But I've never slaughtered a sheep. We had quite a lot of them. And they were part of the flock that I was looking after, goats and sheep. And they just don't mix. And the scary thing about the sheep is that it doesn't fight. It doesn't look, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't move, it doesn't, it doesn't cry. It just look at you as you slaughter it. And I find that was too scary for me to, to do it. I couldn't. I didn't mind to chop the head of a chicken or to slaughter the goat or even the cow. I thought it was fun because it's those, those things they fight. But the sheep, it just look at you. And you have to have something in your mind to really go on with that. And I just didn't have it. 
And that's what Jesus did. He said to his disciples, if I needed help, I, I, I would have not asked you, Peter. I've got host of angels. I don't need to be helped. I came for this. And Isaiah gives us in details of what he went through. And 1 Peter 2, verse 23 to 24, he says, When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judged justly. the Lord Jesus Christ. The second main point that I want us to look at is Jesus, the glorified servant of the Lord, in verse 10 to verse 12. Despite of his personal innocence, as we know that he was tried uh, through the Gospels uh, with various authorities to find out if he he was guilty of being crucified, and they find him innocent, but he was treated like a guilty man. Which raises the question then, who killed Jesus? There are two answers to that. The first answer is that Jesus was killed by God. Look at verse 10. The Bible said, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. It is God who killed Jesus. John 3, 16, the famous passage, God so loved the world that he gave. It carries the idea that God gave Jesus as a sacrifice. He is the one who killed him. It was his will to crush him. He has put him to grieve. That is God putting Jesus to grieve when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring he shall prolong his days, says Isaiah in verse 10. The will of the Lord shall pro prosper in his hand. It is God who killed Jesus. He was accused by heaven. Not for his sin, not of his sins, but for our sins. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He put him to grieve because of our sin. It is God who killed Jesus. The second answer is that Jesus was killed by us. You and I killed Jesus. Not only that Jesus was killed by God, but he was also killed by us. Verse 5 says, he was pierced and crushed for our iniquities and transgressions. It was our sin that killed Jesus. We killed him with our sin and with our hand in a sense that it's, it's us who nailed him. Those who nailed him on the cross, the Roman soldiers, 
they were representing you and I. We were part of them with our sin. We killed him. Peter preaching on the Pentecost in chapter 2 verse, in Acts 2 verse 23 says, this Jesus delivered up according to the, to the definite plan and for knowledge of God, you pointing to the Jews, not to the Roman soldiers. Peter says, you crucified and killed by the hands of the lawless man. But it is you, Jewish people. It is you, Gentiles. It's you and it's me who killed Jesus with our sin and with our hands. And at least this, this, these words from Peter in Acts makes it absolutely clear that we kill Jesus with our sin and our hands. And if you have a problem with that, then you're not a Christian. You start there. A place that we don't go often, a place that if we were going there often, our heart will be on fire for God. A place that we don't want to think about it much, and I don't think some of us have ever thought that it is you as an individual that killed Jesus, not us as a group. I killed Jesus with my sin and with my hand. You killed him with your sin and with your hand. And you're going to stand before God, and he will be the only hope of why God should open the gates of heaven and let you in. We killed him. Number three, he was raised, glorified, honored, and exalted by God. Verse 11 to 12. Remember that verse 13 of chapter 52 opens up with his exaltation. The three verbs, raised, lifted up, exalted, emphasizing the degree of his exaltation. Isaiah 53 verse 11 to 12 says, after he suffered by pouring out his life to death, his soul to death on the cross, bearing our sin and iniquities. That is, after his finished work of sin removing at the cross, he will be satisfied and he will justify many and be honored with the strong. He will be exalted as king. And Paul puts it better in Philippians 2, verse 8 to 11, talking about the incarnate Christ, that though he was God, he did not say equality with God is something to be grasped, but he humbled himself and took the form of a servant. Being found as a servant, he humbled himself and learned obedience to death, even death on the cross. And Paul said, because of that, God gave him a name that is above every name, that is the name of Jesus. Every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth should bow and every tongue confess him, Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We have to do that after reckoning with the fact that we killed him with our sin and with our hands. And Isaiah says, he will justify many who embraces that. Those who come to him and acknowledge that I killed you with my sin and I was part of the crowd. I'm sorry, forgive me, save me. Be my Lord. They will receive justification from him who took 
the place of you and I, of sinners, and became our substitute on the cross. Philippians 2 says, every knee is to bow and every tongue is to confess him, Lord. Have you done that? Is Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior? As we bow our head in prayer, you look at your heart, looking back, have you really done that or you just slot in into the church and for whatever reason you love the church and you ended up becoming a member if you are a member but you have never ever faced the cross. Acknowledge that you are the one that killed Jesus and ask him to forgive you your sins and to save you and to set you free from the power of Satan. You haven't done that. You would like to do that. You can repeat this prayer after me as we close our service. You can repeat it this after me. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. And I believe you died for me on the cross. And I now receive you as my Lord and Savior. Please save me, forgive me, and cleanse me from my sin. And because I believe it, help me not to be ashamed of you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. Father, I pray that many people today even those who will watch this message online, you will, by your spirit, bring them to the knee bowing before the Lord and confessing him as their Lord and Savior. I pray, Father, that you'll save many for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.